Hey, good evening, everybody. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us tonight, uh, today. Um, I'm so excited that you're here. My name is Jeff Dinges. I'm the youth pastor here at Fellowship of the Rockies, um, and I'm just glad that you guys are here. Got a few announcements before we kickstart worship. Children's ministry is now available at our 9 a.m. Sunday morning services, um, and both at both campuses, they're limited. Um, you must register your child each week, so please make sure to do that as they're filling up. Also, if you're not currently participating in a small group, uh, we hope that you'll consider joining one. If you're interested at 8th Street Campus, you can reach out to Rick Sams. Interested at Fountain Campus, you can reach out to Darren Malugin. Um, also, all of these announcements and other important announcements can be, um, you can also read those in our Thursday email blast. We send it out each week. If for some reason you're not getting our emails, just reach out to the church office. We'll make sure that we um, get you back on that list. Uh, so if you have something going on in your life, guys, and, and you need any prayer, um, just let us know. We, Our staff, we count it a privilege to pray for you guys on a weekly basis. Uh, please reach out to us. Email us at prayer at fourchurch.org. Also, if you help or if you feel led to help support the ministries of this church, you can go ahead to uh, the website fourchurch.org slash give. Lastly, whether you're worshiping with us in person or online, um, if you could please make sure to fill out your Connect card. We can also put your prayer request right on there, and we can pray for you on there as well. God bless, and if you'll join us for worship.
come to my rescue and I want to be where you are. So let's sing that out together. I called, yes, I called, you answered, and you came to my rescue and I want to be where you've done so much for us, you came to save us, that we would lift you up, you know, not just when we're in this building, but when we're out, you know, in the real world, when it seems scary, uh, you know, when people disagree with us, Lord, that we would just have that courage, that strength to lift you up, to glorify you, to show your love. you're truly amazing. I pray that we do give you all the glory and the praise. Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat here. Oh, by the way, my name is Rick. Uh, I'm the pastor here at the church, and I'm the director of missions. And I want to introduce you today to Kevin and Julie Gurton, a couple of our world partners. We're going to have a little discussion with them. I'm so glad they're here with us today. Um, thank you guys for coming and sharing. Thank you, Rick. So uh, the first question I want to ask you guys is, where are you currently doing ministry? And what is your people group that you're ministering to? Yeah. Yeah, we've been working for the last 25 years focused on the country of Turkey. We've actually been living there the last seven uh, the Turks are wonderful, awesome, hard-headed people. They are still 99.99% Muslim. Uh, to follow Jesus may mean, well, almost certainly means losing your family, losing your friends, probably losing your job, potentially losing your freedom and even your life. So there's a heavy cost to follow. Uh, nonetheless, God is working there, and people are actually more interested and more responsive than they've ever been before. Julie and I personally are more disciplers than evangelists, and have focused a lot on training. Uh, our big goal right now is raising up native Turks uh, to reach their own country. Great, thanks Kevin. So how has COVID-19 affected your ministry? Well, I think all of us could say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but the great thing is that our God is so infinitely creative. He can come up with far more ways of, new ways of doing ministry than the enemy could ever throw in our, our path as obstacles or this fallen world. So um, we've done a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of internet texting, a lot of meeting outside with masks on, which isn't anybody's favorite thing in a very face-to-face uh, -face culture. One added obstacle for us was that we had just moved to a new city when COVID shut everything down. Due to the deportation of dear friends of ours, there was a team without leaders, so the national director asked us to move to the city and take over, and we felt God said yes, we moved, and that was the end of everything. So we did what we could during that time, meeting our new neighbors, meeting remotely with our team members, but we're looking forward to going back in two weeks. Great. So other than COVID, what has been your greatest challenge? Well, as Julie mentioned, the deportations. It's really quite heartbreaking. Uh, for the last year and a half, the government has just suddenly grown hostile, more extra, extra hostile. Uh, 50 families have been deported in the last year and a half, and it's just continuing. Uh, they're getting uh, meaner, and it's getting worse, frankly. Um, Often people just aren't allowed to come back into the country, so they have no chance to pass things on. They don't have a chance to say goodbye. Uh, it's causing a fair amount of chaos. These people are usually like the pastors, leaders of major ministries, uh, important people, and leaving some serious holes. And yeah, they even got a couple from our organization. Uh, so yeah, it's quite the challenge, quite the challenge. And people are, people are starting to be afraid. Yeah. Can you share one salvation story with us? 
Yes, we chose this one because it's unusual and it's fun. <laughs> we have a young Turkish family that we've really been pouring into the last three years, discipling them and really hoping they will be future leaders in the body of Christ in Turkey. We support them personally. We just believe in them, and the Turkish church is very small and very lacking in resources. So one of the things that they do is they do follow-up work with an online Christian ministry. So when people are seeking online, then this ministry um, sends out the contacts to those in the area where they live to follow up with them. So one night our friend Suat was peeling potatoes and got a phone call from a guy who had some questions from um, researching on this Christian website. And one, a half hour later, when his questions were answered, Suat was able to lead him in the sinner's prayer, making Jesus Lord of his life with a potato peeler in his hand. So <laughs> no, not COVID, not anything can stop what God has in mind and the gospel from going forth. Right. What a great story. Hey, everybody. So if you want to pray for Julie and Kevin or any of our missionaries, we have prayer cards here at the church. Or if you're watching online and you want some prayer cards, just email me at rickforchurch.org. I'd be happy to share some of our prayer cards with you. And right now, I'd like to pray for you guys. Is that okay? All right. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for for individuals like Kevin and Julie who will take your gospel message to the world. Lord, even when it's not easy, even when the world is just throwing things at us, Father, they're still faithful because they know you are faithful. And we just thank you for that. We thank you that um, you give us the ability to support people like Kevin and Julie and that our, our congregation is so generous to be able to allow us to, to do missions. Father, and we just ask that you bless them as they get ready to go back to Turkey. We just pray that their trip will be perfectly smooth and that they'll get through all the wickets they need to get to and can continue to do ministry there. And it's in your son, Jesus Christ, that we claim victory. Amen. Thank you all for your support. All right, guys, it's been great to be your friends and your pastor for all these years. You guys have been doing a great job, and we're so thankful to be a part of your ministry and uh, gr how you graciously allow us to do that. So, all right, so uh, we're going to get to Matthew chapter 3 in just a little bit, guys. So if you want to get your Bibles open there, Matthew chapter 3. And um, we, we, are gonna, we begin a new series today called Back to Truth. You know, we're... I think we're going back to school. Is that what we're doing? I'm not quite sure, but you know, we're in the back to season, so we're going to call it back to truth. And uh, truth is something that is so important to us. A and at the same time, m much of culture is put truth into the fluid category. I mean, it, it probably... It, uh, a great uh, embarkation into this new philosophy was Friedrich Nietzsche. He's a German philosopher. It was really against uh, modernism, and and he was it was really for modernism, and he was against uh, religion and politics and morality in Europe. and And he made a statement, and I'm paraphrasing it because it's in English. But he said, "The only absolute is." There is no absolute. Now, now, besides his whole philosophical reasoning being anti-God and anti-Christianity, the, the statement makes no sense. How can the only absolute be there is no absolutes? Because if there is no absolute, then that statement is absolutely wrong, right? I mean, it is, it, and many people now have have gone into this fluidity of what was known as which was once known as truth now i understand and we're not going to go down a, a big huge track in theology because we got something much more important to engage in but i i i understand that that beliefs uh, 
can be subjective and personal, right? It, 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 there, there's some of that that goes on. Is objective and consistent. Guys, it spans across all spectrums. So the truth that we are going to explore today is in God's word is the true one of the truths about God and that is God is a trinity. Now, I love the topic of the trinity. I, I, I'm fascinated by it. I'm captivated by it. It turns around in my mind over and over again. And the primary reason why I am captivated by the Trinity in the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is three in one, is it screams the truth that God, in his essence, in his makeup, in his very being, God is a relationship. God himself is a relationship, and, and as image bearers of God, he then created us to be relational beings. It's a huge part of our understanding about God and ourselves. Now, there, there are a lot of people that sort of gloss over or minimize or ignore the subject of the Trinity, and, and so why is that? Well, I think one of the big reasons why that is true is because the Trinity is the most mysterious, perhaps, of all the essential doctrines about our faith in God. And, and some people don't do well with mystery. And, and so they, they push back on it. But the, the base, the, the, the most consistent reason that I hear from people who say why they, they don't explore the Trinity or why they aren't for the Trinity. Uh, we, uh, it's because, you know, I don't under, pastor, I don't quite understand it, so I just don't think about it a whole lot, right? Well, guys, let me give you some thoughts about this. It's the people that have written some really profound statements about it. Michael Reeves, the author of the book, Delighting in the Trinity, express, expresses our basic problem with the Trinity this way. He says the Trinity, it, it, the problem with the Trinity is that it's seen not as a solution and a delight, but as an oddity and a problem. We look at it as, I don't quite understand that, and so it's confusing and it's, it's a problem, instead of it being a delight and a solution for who God is. I, I, I love his observation. Here's a beautiful thing. You don't need to fully understand the Trinity to worship the Trinity, to pray in the power of the Trinity, uh, or to enter life in the Trinity. You can experience those realities. Okay, so take a little bit of a rabbit trail, okay? I got to read this stuff because this is not, uh, certainly not my area of expertise. But I have discovered, this is what science tells us, that deep within the core of the sun, the temperature is 27 million degrees. The pressure is 340 billion times what the pressure is here on Earth. And in the sun's core, that unthinkable pressure combines to create nuclear reactions. In each reaction, Four protons fuse together to create one alpha uh, particle, which is 0.7% less massive than the four protons that form together. The difference in that mass though, is expelled as energy. And after years and years and years, that energy through a process called convection this energy from the core of the sun finally reaches the surface of the sun and is expelled as heat and light. And I don't understand any of that. Doesn't do one thing for me. But you know what? I don't have to understand it to appreciate the sun or to get a suntan. 
I could just be thankful for the sun. Uh, you know, the same is true about the Trinity. We don't have to fully understand it to appreciate it and receive the benefits of it in our lives. Okay, so uh, there, some of you might be have wondered or wondering even right now, you're thinking, well, I picked a boring week to come to Fellowship of the Rockies, or I picked a boring week to worship with you. And the key question there is, is the Trinity really that important to me? Well, I think there's some good reasons. Let me give you three of them. First one, the Trinity is one of the most important and distinctive doctrines in the Christian faith. The Trinity is one of the truths about Christianity that distinguishes it from all other religious thought. Good reason. Number two, the Trinity is both central and necessary for the Christian faith to be what it is. You remove the Trinity and you remove the Godhead and we have no faith. And number three, worship, prayer, and Christian growth, which are essential to the believer. Those things are essential to the believer, are all contingent on each part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this hard-to-understand concept, which, you know, guys, we're, not, we're never going to get it fully. I'm not even sure that throughout eternity we're fully going to understand it, but certainly this side of eternity, we're never fully going to understand this. But it, 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 just because it's hard to understand or even impossible to understand, it, it doesn't mean there's no value in pursuing a greater understanding of it. And the answer is absolutely not. One of the authors, he gives the illustration about the Trinity and why we should pursue the Trinity. He said, say, if you're married, you happen to be married, and your spouse comes to you, and they say to you, sweetheart, there's something that I really need to share with you about myself. And you're probably not going to understand it fully. It, it's good, it might confuse you, but, but if you will just try to hear me out on this, if you will try to understand this better, then I promise you, our relationship will be better for it what would your answer to your spouse be, right? Okay, let's give it a shot. So guys, let's, let's give, sh give, give it a shot to better understand this beautiful concept of God that we call the Trinity. Okay, Matthew chapter five. Okay, uh, I think, Christy, are you doing the, you doing the slides? I, 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 who's ever doing the slides back there? I think it's my wife tonight. Would you move Matthew to the next verse and then everything else will be the same? So I just made a last minute change before I walked over and forgot to tell them. Okay, so we're gonna get to Matthew chapter three in just a second. Now the Bible is filled with is what we call Trinitarian reference passages passages throughout scattered from Genesis to Revelation that speak that refer to the Trinity and I picked this one Matthew chapter 3 because it's a powerful passage I remember uh, 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 oh probably 12 or 15 years ago because uh, this is my favorite doctrine this is my doctrinal pet peeve this is the one I muse on when I have time to muse right I, I made this offhand comment in church one day I said if they had a bumper sticker that broke for uh, that said I break for Trinitarian references I would put it on my car and a couple people Bart Cook who's sitting in the back sent me bumper stickers I had to put them on my car I don't want any bumper stickers guys but I love passages that speak of tri the Trinitary, give Trinitarian reference. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17 is a great one. It's the, the, the account of Jesus' baptism in Matthew's gospel. And it says this, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Let me pray. God, thank you for being the one that we can't understand fully. 
who wants to worship a God that fits within our mental or physical parameters? God, thank you for being one who in his essence is relationship. Father, I pray that as, as we explore this essential truth about you, about our faith, the Holy Spirit would enable our brains to comprehend things that can only be comprehended through the Spirit. And we have this, this responsibility to pray this in and through the work of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we ask it. Amen. All right, so... Um, now, here in the passage, we see all three members of the Trinity. There's God the Son, he's being baptized, God the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and God the Father who's speaking from heaven. Now, uh, what we know about the Trinity beyond all doubt is the concept and the understanding of the Trinity also explains that each part of the Godhead has a function and or a work to do. Uh, to, to help us understand the Trinity better, but not completely, better, but not completely, we are going to look at a primary function of each part of the Godhead today. So that's how we're going to, that's how we're going to break it down, okay? So uh, we see that God the Father is a designer, God the Son is the Redeemer, and God the Spirit is the indweller, okay? Let's walk through those. Okay, first of all, God the Father who functions as the designer. The, the function of God the Father is as a designer. Now, we need to be careful with our presupposed ideas and our understanding because we see everything pretty literally with a hierarchy, and much of Christianity has done this with the Godhead. So what a lot of Christians have done over the years, they see a uh, sort of a hierarchy within the Trinity, okay? There, there's God the Father who is top dog because God the Father sent the Son. And then God the Son is second dog because he sent the Spirit. And I would, I would say... Because we see in the Scripture that there is mutual submission within the Godhead amongst the three parts of the Godhead. That was probably a little confusing, wasn't it? Okay? What we see, I think, consistently in the Scripture is mutual submission amongst the three parts of the Godhead at different times. I'll give you an example. Okay, uh, Jesus did go and go to earth because the Father sent him to go to earth. But... But the Father has to give to Jesus all those who believe in him. And, and Jesus had to leave so that the Holy Spirit could come and do its primary work in our lives. Right? There's this mutual submission that takes place. So simply because generally you hear God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is not like this. Right? It's not this order, but we're here with God the Father. All right. Uh, what we clearly know about God the Father is there are passages that declare that he is the designer. Uh, Isaiah 48, 13 says, My own hand laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens when I summoned them. They all stand up together. Okay? So God the Father, God the designer... He was the conceptual creator of heavens and earth. He designed the galaxies and everything in them. And we, man, we love to explore the phenomenon of our universe, don't we? Whether it's the tiniest of particles to the vastness of outer space, we, we are compelled to that. And all of that was designed by the Father, by our amazing God. He placed the sun in the right spot with the right dimensions to create the right atmosphere, all that stuff, so that we could exist. 
He placed the, the moon where it is and the stars in the universe and he formed the, the smallest of particles known to mankind. All of that was designed by our Heavenly Father. And, and what we see and explore as we learn about this part of the Trinity is that God, the, the one true God, was the designer of everything. 1 Corinthians 6.8 takes it just a step further, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 8 says, Yet for us there is but one God. For us there is but one God. The Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. And there's a lot in here. We're not going to get to it all. But what we're going to do is we're going to use this to transition from God the Father, because we see the clear God the Father, the designer, and now here's God the Son who is introduced, and, 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 and the one God the Father designed and gives purpose, and God the Son now makes that purpose possible. Okay? So, um, uh, there, there's... God the Father who functions as a designer, and now we're going to jump into God the Son who functions as the Redeemer. And we clearly see this truth in Hebrews 11, okay? I'm sorry, Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, 1. Looks like 11, but it's 1, colon 1. All right, all right. It says, Hebrews 1 says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times, and in various ways. So B, BC, before Jesus Christ, right? Right? Many times, various ways. But in these last days, our days, after Christ, right? Uh, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now, we see in this passage, uh, we see representation in this passage, first of all. You know, Jesus Christ is the representation of God, right? He's the perfect, clear representation for humanity of God. In, in the passage, we, we see radiance, right? He's the radiance of God's glory. But the most important thing we see in the passage is we see redemption in this passage. After he provided purification of sins... Jesus Christ, God the Son, is the only one that can provide redemption, purification, forgiveness of our sin. Now, sin sets all of humanity on a direction that without the work of Jesus Christ will result in eternal separation in the place called hell. But through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, possible for us to have an eternity with God in heaven when we believe in that work of Jesus Christ. God the Son is our Redeemer. He sets us on the path of life and redemption. Now, Jesus, back in our original passage, we, see, we saw that, that Jesus was... Um, Jesus was working here on earth. He was being obedient to Christ in his baptism, right? And, and then uh, in Matthew 3.60, back, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. Now, we know, the scriptures tell us, that the reason why Jesus did this is he was just simply being obedient to the Father. Why was he being obedient to the Father by being dunked, submersed, emerged, submerged in water 
in the, in the Yaki Jordan River. It was because this was, a, this was a statement, this was a proclamation of his ultimate act of obedience, which was the cross, which resulted in his physical death, burial, and resurrection. By the way, a little bit of a rabbit trail in the Trinity passage uh, today. That's why Fellowship of the Rockies, we practice baptism by immersion, Right? Because when someone is baptized by immersion, it, it, it's a clear statement that they are being identified with God the Son's redemptive work of death, burial, and resurrection. By the way, you know, last Sunday, last Sunday, uh, I think it's one of the top 25 church, it has to be top 25 moments in Fellowship of the Rockies. We had 10 of our students. Ten of our students, guys, at church professed their faith and demonstrated that by being baptized out on the deck in our outdoor worship service. It was a phenomenal moment. It ties us, guys, it ties us to God the Son who functions for our redemption. It is crazy. It's amazing. All right, so, so God the Son functions as Redeemer. God the Father functions as uh, Designer. And now we're going to talk about God the Holy Spirit that functions as the Indweller. Now, in, in our original passage, we get a glimpse of the Holy Spirit in, his, in its, in its pre-ascension modality. Because before the ascension, before Acts 2, before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would come upon people, would come work upon them. It would come and go. But post, right? That's what it said. It came as a dove from heaven. It's alighting on Jesus, right? You see that. But now post ascension, post baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit actually indwells the lives of those who believe in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Hang with me here, because this is amazing. This is amazing, guys. Look, look, at, uh, look at Romans 8. Ro Romans 8, verses 9 through 11 says this. You, and I'm just going to assume that the yous here in the room or in their rooms uh, watching, that you are those who have accepted and believed in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. It, it, if that's you, this is what God says about what the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit does in your life, how he relates to you. Okay, you however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. <laughs> Has anybody ever seen anybody raised from the dead? Has anybody seen a dead person? Guys, that the spirit that is alive in you as a believer in Jesus Christ is the the same spirit who has the power to literally resurrect a dead person. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Okay, so this passage puts it real clear. Verse 9, he says, the Spirit of God lives in you, right? And, and then verse 10 says, if Christ is in you, then verse 11 says, the Spirit is living in you. 
Guys, this is, this is simply, the, 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 the simplest way to understand is this. Uh, to be with Christ is to have the Spirit. And to have the Spirit is to be with Christ. They are inseparable. When you trust in Christ, you have the Spirit. And when you have the Spirit, you trust in Christ. Guys, the Holy Spirit is needed for the believer in Christ to live. Because it's the Holy Spirit that, that enables the believer to make the right decision. To see things that can only be revealed from the Spirit. There are some things that can't be seen with the physical eye, but the Spirit can reveal that. The Holy Spirit is essential for, for the life of the believer. All right, so uh, wrap up here with this key truth. It, it, without the Trinity, the Christian faith does not exist. Uh, and and what, what may be even more cool than that is without the Trinity, it is impossible for us to realize the Christian life. Let me just back it up. God the, God the designer. Yes, he, he designed and he has a plan for the universe, right? And, and gravity and all that stuff. But more importantly, he has a design for your life. He has a plan for you. In fact, every single one of your days has been numbered, and he has a plan for that, okay? We can't realize any of that plan, which is God's plan is always life, right? Life here, life eternal. We can't realize any of that plan without the redemptive work of the Jesus, without the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, God the Son, because that frees us from the sin burden that we all we all have, and we can't know how to live in that freedom without the work of the Jesus, uh, without the work of the Holy Spirit. Guys, the Trinity is so essential, not just for our understanding about the Christian faith, but for our life as Christians. So you got something going on this week. I bet you got a decision or two you want to make. Guys, all aspects of the most, in my opinion, the most amazing doctrine of, of the Christian faith are at work in that decision. Let me pray. God, thanks so much for, for your, your amazing truth, this dimensional reality that, that our human brains are not going to fully be able to understand. We, we may never fully be able to understand it, even in eternity with you. But God, what we can appreciate is this amazing truth and how it works so powerfully, not just in the concept of our world, but in the function of our lives as well. And, and for that, God, we are profoundly excited to explore the amazing truth of the Trinity. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up with worship. So everybody, can, if you're in here, you stand up. If you're at home, stand up and, and join with us in the last worship song. Let me just talk to you for a second, though. Everybody stand up. You guys want everybody stand up? This is going to be short, I promise. Yeah, I made a big assumption tonight. I, I, I stole a base. I said, I'm assuming that all of you are believers in Jesus Christ. But I really don't know that that's the case. But what I do know is that's the most important decision you're ever going to make. If, if you happen to be worshiping today in the, in the church with me, 
Guys, uh, and you're not. You don't know that. Come see me. I'll be hanging out. I won't be hard to find. If you're worshiping online, uh, email me. It's really easy. Stuart at fourchurch.org. Email me. We'll get together virtually or in person somehow, some way to help you make certain that you are a believer in Jesus Christ and therefore you have the the powerful work of the Trinity uh, going with you and for you as well. All right, let's uh, wrap up in one last song, Jordan.
Everybody would see that you were God. We want to see your kingdom grow. We want to be part of the healing of this nation, your church, the healing in this world. We pray that you would use us. See you again next week.